which founder is known as the father of American jurisprudence? Hi, my name is Jason. Welcome to Founder of the Day. And today we're going to discuss Nathan Dane. Now, Nathan Dane is often forgotten to be mentioned when we talk about the founding of the United States, but he played an integral role. So let's take it from the beginning and, and maybe along the way we can figure out some of the reasons he might be overlooked. First of all, Nathan Dane came from a fairly poor family. His father was a simple farmer, but Nathan's intelligence shone through and he was able to verify this and make his way into Harvard University. Now, Harvard, Harvard, of course, is still famous and at the time was humongously important. If you were able to get an education there, then you would probably succeed in life. And Dane did. He got his degree, he became a lawyer, and opened a successful practice. Now, one of the reasons we overlooked Dane is he didn't really come onto the scene until fairly late in the game. It wasn't until after the victory at Yorktown that he was even elected to the Massachusetts State Assembly. Uh, he spent a few years there before being sent to the Continental Congress as a delegate. And this is where he really starts to make his name for himself. In the Continental Congress, he is most famous for, uh, for being a, a major, one of the main authors of the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. Now there were a few Northwest Ordinances, but the Ordinance of 1787 was extremely important because, first of all, it brought all these territories that were in the West that now make up states like Ohio and Indiana and Illinois, uh, Michigan, uh, Wisconsin, parts of Minnesota. This is what really brought them all in as, well, territories of the United States. Uh, they weren't states yet, but it also defined what they needed to do to become a state. Uh, how, how big their population had to be, how their government had to be organized, things of this nature. Now, the most important part is a part that Dane wrote. It's Article 6, which is the abolition of slavery in the Northwest. Now, it's pretty obvious right off the bat why that might be important, because slavery is terrible and it was needed to go. Um, however, what's interesting is this article passed unanimously in the Continental Congress, which begs the question, why would the Southern delegates want slavery to be illegal in the Northwest? Turns out there's a few answers for this. First and foremost, and often forgotten because of the Civil War, which would happen 80, 70, 80 years later, um, most of the founders thought slavery was a dying institution. You had, uh, for several reasons, it was slowly not becoming not profitable. That's why when they write the Constitution, they everyone was like, yeah, 20 years and we'll stop importing. It wasn't until during the Washington administration that Eli Whitney would go on and create the cotton gin, which would totally backfire when it comes to getting rid of slavery because it suddenly made it real profitable and people went for it. Let's not get too off topic. Um, in addition to slavery, people thinking slavery was going to disappear, uh, Southerners didn't want competition from plantations in the Northwest, uh, nor did they think it would be, uh, it would have been very difficult to transport slaves there, uh, which would have been expensive and hard, um, and the only other option would have been to attempt to enslave Native Americans who were already at war with and really would never su submit uh, is the assumption, but uh, that's neither here nor there. But either way, uh, D Nathan Dane was the one who outlawed slavery in the Northwest and therefore later on when it was the whole north of the Mason-Dixon, he was a, it, it, a lot of that stemmed from his earlier work. Now, the following, or earlier that same year, about the same time, I guess I should say, uh, people were coming back and saying, hey, we had this meeting in Annapolis, this Annapolis convention, and it didn't go very well. well Nathan Dane is the one who got on the floor of the Continental Congress and, and motioned that they have a meeting in Philadelphia to revise 
the Articles of Confederation. Now, of course, neither Dane nor anyone there really realized that they would be writing a new government and doing away with the Articles, but that is what happened. When that happened, Dane did support the Constitution. He did think there was a need for a, a more unified federal government. Um, he was a little nervous about parts of it and seems to have been relieved when the, uh, the Bill of Rights was signed. Um, and then Dane kind of steps back. He serves in local Massachusetts government, but he focuses on his law practice. Um, and then he, years go by, and he attends the Hartford Convention. Now, I'm sure I will do an entire video on the Hartford Convention. Uh, suffice to say, after the War of 1812 started, a lot of federal, former Federalists in the northern states did not like what was going on with the federal government. And the Hartford Convention, while they never outright said they wanted to secede from the United States, people who weren't invited, a lot of people in the southern states, claimed that's what they said, and it was an embarrassing meeting to attend. To be fair, Nathan Dane was sent there on purpose as a moderate to, and now a little bit older, to make sure some of the younger dudes didn't get out of hand. Which, his success there can be uh, hard to determine. <laughs> um, uh, that being said, as, a, as an, a delegate to the Hartford Convention, it's certainly one of the reasons we don't talk about him a lot today. However, we should talk about him more, because that same Hartford University that, we, that he had attended and we spoke about earlier, he went back there and helped to fund the Hartford, the Hartford School of Law, or Hartford Law School. I'm not sure what the name of it is exactly, but Harvard's Law School, Nathan Dane helped create. And to this day, that is one of the most important law schools in the world. Uh, additionally, he found great wealth and success when he wrote uh, the, the Laws, uh, A Digest of American Law. And this, because there weren't a lot of lawyers around the colonies, this was the first book, a nine-volume <laughs> feat of writing that he accomplished that outlined all of America's legal code. And therefore, every law office in the United States of America bought a copy. And first of all, nine volumes is nine times the income. And to have any successful publication, especially back then, I mean, that was celebrity. So he made a vast fortune, which again, he invested most of into the law school to help get that off the ground. It was his way of giving back to his country. So... We'll leave the life of Nathan Dane there. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them in the, the comments section below. Uh, if you want to watch another video, there'll be one right about here. If you want to subscribe to this website, uh, I'm sorry, this page, so you can see all of my videos, there's a little picture of my logo here. He's a nice little founder who wants to go run around, found the United States. Uh, give him a click. And uh, if you hit the like button, it helps other people find this in their feed. So thank you so much for watching and I will see you tomorrow.